own uh, experience, and I've played with this for 20 years, uh, is that different ways, different estimators produce different results, that Heckman and matching work one way, and instrumental variables work in a different way. Channels. So how does democracy affect development? One way to think about it is uh, democracy affects something, investment, education, and then investment and education affects growth. Another one is uh, that democracy affects growth directly given uh, exogenously taken investment education. Studies of the first kind tend to produce more positive results for democracy than studies of the second kind. Uh, and there are, again, selection bias issues in there because if uh, one cannot manipulate regimes without manipulating the other causal channels, uh, then you don't, cannot isolate whether it's regime or some other factor. So, the conclusion. I don't think there is a single post-1980 study that shows that on the average, non-democracies grow faster. So I think that that belief we can hold. It's not true on the average that authoritarian regimes, autocracies of any kind, grow faster than democracies. Um, but I don't think that we know whether democracies, in fact, grow faster. Uh, 20 years ago, when I was sick and tired with all these divergent results, I said, I'm going to do everything possible in the world to see what it really looks like. That's going to be the final word, but it's not the final word, and now I believe there is no final word here, he said. Um, running the causality the other way. So now from development to democracy. It's sort of a symmetrical, I think a similar situation. Namely, there is no doubt in my mind that once established in wealthy, high-income societies, democracies are certain to survive. In 1997, uh, Fernando Limonji and I observed that this is 1997 with data that ran until 1990. No democracy ever fell in a country with per capita income higher than that of Argentina in 1976. Well, since then, there have been 42 democracies with incomes higher than that of Argentina in 1976. They've gone through all kinds of crises, financial crises, divorce, scandals, wars, riots. Not a single one fell. There are people who try to pull all kinds of econometric tricks to invalidate that result. I think it's just a wasted effort. That's the way the world is. I mean, once established, once established in wealthy countries, democracies, Survive. Uh, whether economic development generates democracy, that is, is the probability of transition to democracy increasing in per capita income. On that again, we have results all over the world. Uh, I produced some results saying not namely that the modernization theory is false, uh, that there was a retort by Boyce and Stokes. Uh, there are, I think, 2,000 articles on that topic these days. And again, uh, depending on the estimator, depending on the sample, depending on the data sources, you get different results. The US piece on that, I which goes over all of the econometric issues is by Benavid Korvalan and Spiegel. So, again, I think we can believe that uh, 
democracy survived in wealthy countries, as the probability of democracy collapsing is independent, then sorry, that declines in income. We don't know whether the probability of the country becoming democratic increases. I will not summarize the latter literature, but I want to focus on elections. This is not just a matter of a classical modernization theory versus institutions. Uh, it turns out that elections have an autonomous effect on survival of democracy. Autonomous, I think, from growth. Uh, so here's, think of it this way. There's some regime and the regime breaks out. Uh, we have a spring, if you wish. Yes, that's what we call it these days. Uh, what typically happens? Well, typically, whoever comes to power, I shouldn't have said spring, because whoever comes to power rushes to hold elections. 58% uh, of such events were followed by elections within 30 months. And that's for good reasons. Elections make all kinds of regimes last longer. Uh, even new dictators like to have elections. Why do they like to have elections? Because they want to show the people who brought them to power is that the people right behind them, uh, that they have some independent source of support, of power, of control of the state apparatus from uh, the times that followed them as they occupied the presidential palace. So in fact, yes, any kind of elections extend lives of regimes, contested elections, elections with opposition extend lives even more, and alternation in office. By this I mean change of the control of the office of the chief executive between parties has, I think, a crucial role in consolidating democracy, which is one of the reasons I'm really optimistic about Tunisia. Partisan alternations are very difficult. Note, yes, as of 2009, 68 countries in the world never experienced one in their history, and that includes China and Russia. Neither China or Russia ever experienced an event in which an incumbent government lost an election and yielded office. They are difficult, I think, because if it never happened before, nobody really knows what's going to happen if it occurs. And stakes may be extremely high. The question becomes then, what will the winners of elections do to the losers of elections? Think of President Putin. What would happen to him if he allowed himself to lose an election? <laughs> so sometimes stakes are just too high. That's, I think, it's very difficult. Uh, the question is, is the opposition going to just defeat you or destroy you? But it's amazing that once one occurs, subsequent alternations are more likely, and regime breakdown becomes highly unlikely. Here is a little table. In the left column you have the number of past alternations. Then you have the probability that the incumbent will lose an election given the number of past alternations. The probability that the incumbent would obey, that is, would leave office if lost and the probability that an alternation will occur. And as you see, if you have no alternation, the probability one would occur is just 12%. With one, with 30, with two is 45. This is perhaps more striking. The table is constructed in the same way, but the probability you should look at is the probability that a regime breaks down given the number of past alternations. So somebody comes into office, maybe holds elections, but never loses. Half of such cases end up with the incumbent being deposed by force. By broke, I mean coups, civil wars, mass riots, events like this. 
If one alternation occurs to one end, that probably goes to point one eight. Yes. And eventually no, point one. So this experience, the experience of having one memory of the fact that power can change by elections and nothing much happens is crucial in consolidating our democracy. And when you do regressions, it turns out that growth doesn't matter as much as I really regressions these days. Uh, but here, personally, <laughs> well, I mean, that data I didn't. Um, unemployment may matter, yes, because we know you know, unemployment is not a measure that travels well across countries. It's unusual in cross national research because the differences in definitions are so enormous and the size of informal sector is unemployment is a, is a parameter of formalized labor markets. So it really doesn't travel very well. And it really might make that I'm very impressed by the experience of my own countries where actually I did some survey research or collaborative survey research during the period of transition. And what was really striking about that is that people were willing to suffer lower wages during the period of transition, political and economic. They were willing to suffer inflation, but they were not willing to suffer unemployment. This is, you know, all the questions in which we concern unemployment, people would say, if it's, I'm going to be unemployed, if unemployment is going to be high, I'm turning against this process. So, growth may have different political, unemployment may have political effect specific as distinct from growth. And with this I'm going to be well behaved. Um, because, <coughs> this is the last part of what I have to say. the point from which Professor Valari started, namely, if you make a list of tigers and disasters at any period of time, I've done it in the 90s, I've done it many, many times since then, that is, you know, take the countries that develop faster over some sustained period of time, 10 years, and countries that decline fastest during the same period of time. On any such list, most tigers, most miracles are going to be some kind of autocracies. Not all, but most. All of the disasters are going to be autocracies. So, obviously the variance of economic performance is much greater in non democracies now, you can think, as a matter of fact, it's three times higher. If you look at the variance of growth rates, it's three times higher in the non-democracies, I classify them, than the democracies. But you may easily say, in a reasonable way, well, that's because most researchers define democracy and then sort of say whatever is not a democracy is, is the other. So whatever they call it, dictatorship, authoritarian regime, autocracy, so, it's by construction that these regimes should be more heterogeneous. But, um, one can do the following. One can take spells of particular regimes. Democracy in this country between this period and that period. A particular type of authoritarian regime, say the regime of the Shah in Iran, regime of the Mura in Iran. So distinguish regimes finer, and then look at variance within spells, and the variance within the non-democratic spells is going to be twice as high as the variance within the democratic spells. One can go even further. One can now take spells of a particular regime under the leadership of a particular chief executive. So these are really finely defined spells. And the variance is still going to be 1.6% higher under non-democracies. Yes, what this says 
is at least <coughs> experience of economic performance. It's much less stable, much more very much more unstable under authoritarian regimes. There are all kinds of explanations, as you know. One goes back to Amartya Sen, the firearm, namely that in democracies, yes, people uh, scream alarm when things are really going badly. Note, by the way, that some people misconstrue, I think, Sen's argument as being an argument about averages. His argument is not about averages. In fact, mentality, in, I mean, India never experienced a famine. China experienced a famine, infant mortality, and other indicators of health in India are much worse and have been much worse than in China. Yes? So he's not comparing averages, he's comparing variables. He's basically saying real disasters cannot happen in democracies. That's one argument. Another argument is that in democracy, to approve any kind of projects, obviously, thinking in model terms, uh, you need to build a coalition. So if you have some amount of money in Project ABC, you need to build coalitions, which means that maybe you have to undertake two of them. While under a dictatorship, the dictator can compare ABC, choose which one he likes, and just choose one of them. Well, if the world is stochastic, if rates of return are stochastic, that will obviously mean that the variance to undertaking two projects is going to be lower than the variance to undertaking one project, yes. So coalition building under democracy leads to lower variance of economic results. And the third one is about elections. Um, um, so, I was actually hesitating. I have a paper which is a model with just very little data, which asks, so what are the properties of peaceful, democratic, sorry, peaceful, competitive elections? If you have a conflict, a conflict in which there are two political forces that can use force as an alternative to elections. So this is what we're thinking about elections under the shadow of force. Political forces can either participate in elections and obey their, their results, or can revert to force. And the question then becomes, so what must be true for elections to be peaceful and competitive when political forces can revert to force? And the basic answer is what you see over there, namely that results of elections must make some difference, but they cannot make too much difference. And what that means, to return to the theme of my uh, predecessor, what that means in divided societies, uh, what this means is the following, that checks and balances are unproductive in highly homogeneous societies. Because in highly homogeneous societies, elections have to process some part of the conflict there is. If elections don't process any of the existing conflicts, then nobody cares. What happens then? Then you have very long ten years of one party in power. The record holder in the world is Luxembourg. In Luxembourg, Control over government has not changed in 143 years, from 1830 to 1973. Or you have cases like Sweden, Sri Lanka, 36 years. Yes. If societies are homogeneous and very little is at stake, the same party yes. Checks and balances on the other hand are important, or limitations on the chief executive more broadly, I think are more important in polarized societies. Because there, in some ways, the role of elections is not to put everything at stake. Yes? To so limit the range of what is at stake in this process of conflict management. Yes. So 
Yeah. In the U.S., the U.S. Constitution, it said, religion is not going to be a subject of elections. We take that out, the God rule. It's a private matter, yes. So why? Because if religion was a question of elections, we would end up killing each other. So this is, I think, where, where super majoritarian institutions, executive veto, bicameralism, or contra majoritarian institutions, constitutional review, yeah, that's where they really matter. So sort of by eliminating, forcing coalitions and eliminating extreme policies. Anyway, so that's my explanation, but the fact is that variance of birth rates are lower, democracies progress perhaps slowly but steadily, while non-democracies experience sharp up and downs. Finally, let me just comment on political stability and growth. There's, again, a huge literature on this topic which originally claimed that political instability is bad for growth. But when you start looking at it, you discover something really interesting. Namely, that all kinds of indicators of quote-unquote political instability, mass demonstrations, mass strikes, uh, yeah, I know, uh, even riots, don't affect growth in democracies. They do sharply lower the rate of growth in non-democracies. Why? Because in democracy we expect to have demonstrations and strikes at this. Riots, maybe not, yes. But it's a normal life of democracy that sometimes when people are unhappy, they go on the street. Uh, and indeed, we can see that investors and producers don't react to such events. They're routine. While under authoritarian regimes, when a lot of people go on the street, that says that regime may not last long, things may really change, and investment and growth decline. With which I conclude on an optimistic, positive note. Namely, that even if average rates of growth are the same, one, democracies ena democracy enable people to plan their lives. And that turns out to be very important, I can't enter into that now. But even with regard to fertility, just think, in a democracy, no government can reduce nominal old age pensions. That would be suicidal, electric, yes. So if you're a young person, and there is some kind of a retirement system, you know the rates may be slightly higher, slightly lower. Yeah, the age of retirement may change, the indexing system may change, but the program will not be eliminated. You can count on it. You can plan your life. It turns out under authoritarianism, you cannot. If you do regressions, the <clears throat> expenditures on social security and welfare, which is mainly pension, pensions, reduce fertility in uh, democracies have no effect in other. So people, yes, expect it and plan using it. And two, this democracy is exactly, they allow people to go on the street. They allow people to strike. They allow people to express their views, not only through the electoral mechanism, but through other mechanisms, in relative peace and some Thank you.